Um, so when we think of comics, we obviously don't necessarily, America and Europe being what they are, we're always fascinated with this idea of amnesia. So what I want to do is just pull up a couple histories of um, alternative iconography, and if you look at the, even the funny thing with these Ethiopian comics from almost a thousand years ago, you can easily see um, you know, the quarter page kind of scenario, the linear narrative, and this is Africa uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago. So 1450, we have an icon that opens and has different pages, and you know these are bound with leather tongs. You can see the little leather here. Um, the different pages and the different kind of you know breakup of the page. Now this was a religious text, and it was meant to be something that was for the Coptic Christian faith, and it was also something that um, people had to memorize the various stories and be able to invoke them with uh, sort of liturgical chants and so on. Um, now, if we look at Hebrew culture, if we look at Europe and so on, everybody had this kind of textuality. But comic books usually would be something that was reductionist and allowed people to really get a lot of sort of visual sound by in a proto kind of uh, literate way. So uh, when they talked to me about joining this effort here for the um, comic book convention, what I wanted to do was kind of start with my version of things, which is multimedia. And um, behind me you have a very famous image. It's of Eddie and Jules Murray from 1915. Um, and it's one of my favorite kind of popularizers of this idea of stop-motion photography. So it breaks apart motion. Now, in 1915, Scientific American, obviously, you know, as it is today, was something that was a forum for thinking about ideas, but photography was still very new. So this idea of stop-motion photography, for me at least, is a popularization of the idea of sampling. It's something that plays with fragments, creates sequences, and also gives you a sense of narrative momentum. Um, I'm a huge fan of photography, but what I want to do is take you back a little bit further. I'm going to do this very condensed because I know we're on a tight schedule. Um, and I want to show you one of my favorite uh, sort of comic strip guys, and his name is Melies. Now, in 1900, he was a magician, and he wanted to create film that was the equivalent of magic tricks. So you have to remember back in 1900, if a train was coming out of the screen, people would get up and run because they actually felt it was that real. Um, and what you're going to see here is one of the first video sequence pieces where he's actually sampling himself and creating a kind of equivalent of a comic strip, but actually from film. So Sound and Bound is the book, and I'll get back to that in a second, but here we go. <coughs> Il y a donc presque 100 ans, Méliès représente ce qu'il était réellement dans la vie, un homme orchestre. So when you read a comic book, you're not necessarily thinking about the idea of realism. You're kind of getting into someone's interpretation of a scene or a scenario. They're expanding and fleshing out a story that might have been reduced to, again, a very specific you know, two-dimensional scenario. But as we've been seeing with the success of movies like, of course, the X-Men, Batman, Batman 7, Batman 20, whatever, you know, <laughs> is that comics lend themselves to the kind of the DNA of storytelling of this early 21st century moment. And uh, whether it's the whole, you know, the whole notion of the web 2.0 scenario of social networks and how people exchange mediums and how they actually exchange media, um, I'm really looking at much more from a viewpoint of this idea of improvisation, jazz, and how people have, um, for lack of a better word, kind of living in an inf information overload. So I'm always referencing Warren Coleman because I really, he's a big hero for me, the idea of harmonics, of the play of the motif. So comics actually, especially, you know, my favorite stuff is manga. 
Um, you'd have to imagine that the motif is something that is essentially like a sound bite. It's a, it's a motif that's an audio logo or something that's a kind of memory that's easily transposed in radically different contexts. That's why we look at serialism uh, in comic form. So, um, some of my favorite other people dealing with that, of course, Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill. If you look at what was going with the Three Penny Opera, it was meant to be the People's Opera. Uh, literally, you had to pay three cents to get in. And uh, this is in Weimar Republic, Germany, in the 20s, right before Hitler. Uh, and Kurt Weill came up with this idea of what he called Gebrauchsmusik, which was meant to be reductionist music that was able to be accompany any scene made of repetition of motifs. So this was opera as comic book. Now, Kurt Weill is one of my all-time favorite playwrights because he was so successful with the sense of not only ironic critique of social you know, dynamics in the Weimar era, uh, of course, in sense of, you know, the, the whole notion of the Weimar Republic was the uneasy tension between the, the collapsing society and this idea of a neo-totalitarian state coming in. Of course, we're very familiar with that now with Bush. But, um, <laughs> you know, the Weimar Republic was one of my favorite eras of the 20th century because it was this explosion of free-form material, uh, you had a lot of the war veterans coming back to Berlin. You had new art movements popping up, the Dada, the Surrealists, and so on. Everybody who had been affected by the war essentially was looking for new forms, whether you're the Italian futurist or if you're the Dadaist, and the, you know, it was coming out of the whole notion of what was going on out of breaking down old form. So I'm going to go quickly through this, because the book um, Sound and Bound just came out, and it's 36 essays, um, most of them relating to sound as a contemporary art form looking at cross-collision and hybridity between genres, cultures, and styles. So um, I got Allen Ginsberg's estate to give me his voice uh, for the lead single of the album, and I was thinking of doing a quick remix of that, but I know, given our time constraints, I might come back to that later and sort of do a, a, a story <coughs> mashup. But um, I want to just play a quick example. I'm going to skip ahead. There we go. All right. Um, speaking of going back to theater and comics as a reductionist theater, um, I, my first film was coming up, and I got the rights to D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of the Nation, in 1915. Um, and D.W. Griffith left his estate to Harvard, and we got in touch with them to get the rights for the film. And again, this film was a reductionist stereotype model. Everybody has a cardboard cookie cut out of a character. It's whites and blackface. There's almost no black people in the film, but it's still crazy racist. Um, <laughs> and the funny thing is, um, when I wanted to remix it, the idea was to apply DJ technique to film, which DJing is essentially as you look for motifs, you look for sequences, and you try and figure out this way of creating new from old and reprocessing the various bits and pieces of a project. So with Birth of a Nation, you have to remember Griffith was America's finest storyteller. Um, a lot of his film projects have essentially become the DNA of how we tell stories. He invented the close-up technique, he invented multiple threads of a story going on simultaneously, and he was also a pioneer of this idea of emotive storytelling in a way that the film, it was a three-hour epic, and uh, he used Wagner, who's also another kind of comic book character, because you can think of Gesamtkunstwerk, which is the German term for total art form. So I've, had, I've been having the film tour at radically different places, and we even got the Greek government to give me the Acropolis for an evening. And um, this is hip hop, so you know that's how we do it. Um, <laughs> so I had them put base woofers throughout the ruins. You can see these 30 foot high. That's a person down there. So we had about 5,000 people come to the show, and I projected, when the Greek government, I was in negotiations with them, and they were like, why does he want to play a, cookie, a KKK film at the Acropolis? <laughs> um, and so I was just saying, you know, you guys are Greek, you know, we have comedy, tragedy, and they're like, oh, we get it. <laughs> so, uh, the, whole, the whole notion of early theater was that the characters were unamplified, they wore masks, and they had to be, really be able to communicate with the audience from the proscenium. And um, the, the fun part about the digital multimedia thing is that you have to think about nonlinear imagination and this idea of a collapse of hierarchies and how people normally put together a sequence of events. And so the pun here is you walk out on stage, or I walk out on stage and say, hi everybody, I think I'm the first DJ to play here in 3,000 years. <laughs> so when you're looking at comics, they're not only about a certain kind of nonlinear quality or that reductionist motif quality, but what I think Corey's had been able to evoke in his new book as well, uh, Little Brother, was uh, a kind of a very quick sequencing. Um, it's a fast-paced novel, and I'm going to tie some of this into what he's doing, so, and then pass the mic, so to speak.